Welcome back to the shop, gentlemen. Fig dick, Milwaukee. We got a pumpa. Feels quite stout. Got a clear viewing window. Right full of the schmoo. Time! I can see this being useful if you can turn it on and let her chooch. Because this drill pimp, while being, well, a tenth of the cost, you know, this thing's 20 bucks, and this thing's like a million doll hairs, you gotta run this with a drill. Comes in handy, but if, you know, if you're paying some monkey to run the drill, then it makes sense that you buy this instead. Just convenience wise. So let's look at the tech specs here. Keep them honest anyway. The whole fam family can go buck a fuffle most times. But warning this product contains one or more chemicals by the state of California. It must be rough to live in California. Wash hands after handling. Jesus. What are they putting in here? Right off the hop here, a couple few nice little features. Let me just get my framing right here. There we go. Like it's built for you two. Uh, brass, big brass fittings going into aluminium. Maybe red Loctite it in, or maybe some sort of pipe dope. Shouldn't be a problem unless you're pumping out some salt water or pool water or something. I don't think the uh, electrolytic reaction is that strong between brass and aluminium. Probably, uh, yeah. It's not like you're gonna be using this every day. Well, unless you're a plumber. Let's get that out, see how that is affixed. Uh, look at that, goodly amount of Teflon tape. The other thing I like here is the Cuvarella for the Bataria. It's also got a, oh, got a poo drain hole there. Not quite big enough for a corn nugget, but I guess you just have to pick that out with your teeth. I don't like that hinge particularly seems to me that I get busted off quick fast in a hurry other than that though reasonably stout it does have holes here on the feet so those will get constantly right full of schmoo uh, gravel if you're lucky and human feces if you're not oh just a glimpse beneath the skirts let me in there that is a proper motor Big fucker. That's uh, I'm just kind of hung up on this. Not to worry. Some percussive maintenance. I'll be in like sin. Tap to tap tap. Make sure it's not pinned on the other side. I think I'll drive it from that side. Tap it tap tap. Oh, look at the size of that cork stuffer. This is interesting. Instead of doing a two-shot mold, they've done two. I bet you that's because they've gone with a cheaper plastique. But yeah, for some reason, they've gone with mechanical fastening. We got some Buna and condoms in here for vibration damping. And there's positive affixment for the PCB. Well, it's not... It's just holding it in the slot. Not really fixing the PCB itself is more or less keeping it in that groove. I gotta get the Jesus thing out. That looks pretty good there. Oh, this is cute. This is cute. They left a window in there. What for seeing what this material was. No markings at all on this material. I'm gonna guess it's a ABS sewer pipe. It's a red sheen to her. No glass fiber. Yeah, not a stitch of glass fiber. So that's why they've gone with the two separate materials. Um, well, the two separate parts instead of doing a, a rotary mold and two shot process. Because the outside is proper tool grade plastic and the inside is proper sewer pipe grade plastic. So that's, yeah, that's why they've done that. Not that it really, really matters because where the, where the rubber meets the load here, the 200 pound gorilla meets the tool. 
it's all proper PA6 uh, glass fiber reinforced. Now starting at the battery, I think we see a little problem here is that it's not going to fit the larger size batteries. You're stuck with that max 5 point, uh, let's see, I might have egg on my face here. Yeah, so that'll go in. There's a bit of room there. Where's the 9 oh, bigger battery? Oh, okay. No, nope, my mistake. It will fit the bigger battery. Nominal, it should run for 30 minutes on the 5.0. So run about 50 minutes on the 9.0. Then coming in here, you just got soldered on little connections, little wires going into a circuit board of some sort. And, oh, no, <laughs> cute. No, that's a automotive uh, bayonet style fuse. Stab style fuse. It's a green one, so that's 25 amps. 15 amps. Uh, I could pull it out and show you, I guess. But then you feel bad about yourself. So we'll just leave that in there. Uh, problem already is this spade connector come off. Let's have a closer look at that. Now, why did that come off so easy? I didn't pull on this. I don't believe. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh ah, -huh. ah, uh ah. -huh. Assembly problem. So, if and you got a crib death from, from one of these, or it's just dead, first thing you check, of course, easiest thing, is the fuse. Secondly, you see this? So, the heat shrink tubing is loosey-goosey on there. So then, the dude or dudette what assembled this was pushing, instead of pushing all the way down on the spade to get it connected, they were pushing on the jacket, like so, and then it get, doesn't get attached proper. You see that? You gotta, you gotta get right in there and pull the foreskin down. Get it to properly dock. We got an H bridge here, a couple of MOSFETs. Of course, this is not in reversing motor. You do not want this Japsco style pump to reverse because you'll ruin the lobes on it. They, they use this kind of pump on raw water pumps on, on engines. Detroit diesel uh, two-stroke engines. You see these this style Jabsco pump probably all over the place. But the thing is about um, uh, Detroit diesel two-stroke, it'll run in reverse. You can, you can bar the... Th well, no, you can bar the thing over in reverse and you change the cam and you can have... Uh, counter rotating props this that the other thing so these pumps are well known in marine circles for blowing up when uh, an apprentice gets a hold of them because they bar them the wrong way crushes the lobe over the wrong way and breaks off so this is a non-reversing motor if you ever reverse the leads you will bust this clean off however because it's got a uh, I wouldn't say polycarbonate that's something else. Uh, Lexan style. No, it's Lexan. No, Lexan's not polycarbonate. It's the other one. Polyacrylic. Polyacrylic. So this is polyacrylic here. Not particularly uh, impact resistant. Having a closer look now at the Pixie choreography department. We see an ST micro devices uh, brain box here. Uh, nice name brand bunch of elastic it has been the board has been conformally coated so at least if it gets splashed with some sort of salt water or slightly submerged you clean it off with uh, clean water still water what would you call that not salty water <laughs> uh, and let it dry it should be okay de-energize it take the battery out dry it out should be okay you know once or once or twice it's not a macbook gonna explode at the slightest whiff of uh, jizz on the keyboard not that I'd know anything about that one thing I do not like here this momentary push button well this is a latching switch they've it's open to the elements essentially there's no rubber kind of gaskety thing that seals it up you see that it's not and it doesn't seal up so you get any schmoo in there human feces, corn nuggets, that sort of thing. And the thing's going to seize up on your right cock stiff. So that, eh, uh, didn't like, well, this is nice. They're using these expensive stake-ons and they should be 
they should be heat shrunk, but they're not properly, so that's too bad. A um, couple of current shunts here. Fair size. Well, this isn't doing any real switching. This, you know, you're not doing off on, off on, off on. So all you're really worried about is just on. That's it. And it's in a totem pole configuration. You could do it with one, but this is a more robust scenario here. International Rectum Fryer uh, MOSFETs. No, no dearth of heat transfer compound there. Schmoo all over the place. And yeah, it's not a very big heat sink particularly, but you're not doing any switching. So you're just looking at the at the uh, on resistance. Eh, it's fine. It's fine. And then, as I said there, the current shunt, the shunt resistor so that the brain box can measure how much current is going in there. If it overcurrents, uh, shut her down. On the back side, nothing to her. And see the current paths here, which they've added some solder to in order to increase the current carrying capability. Some vias here for cooling. And yeah, not really all that much to it. Basically turns the motor on, monitors the battery to make sure it doesn't get too hot, and monitors how much current is going in so it can shut down in case the thing shorts up. Moving on now to the rubber, let me just get defangulated here. This feels for all the world like a vulcanized rubber, which would mean it should not melt away to nothing. You would not want like a Buna, something that could melt. You'd want a thermo set plastic rather than a thermoplastic. Same thing with the brush holder and, and bearing assembly at the back here. You wouldn't want this to melt down on you. And that is melting. And that is not. We're at 800 dungarees for Frankenstein. You see there's a proper bearing in there. But that is some sort of PA, probably PA66 with a whole bunch of glass fiber in there. Over 50 or 50% 50 or thereabouts. But, uh, nice big shaft, through shaft. And of course this would be a permanent magnet DC motor. It's a uh, Lachette. The, LS13S, which I happened to print it off here, and she's uh, she's pretty fucking beefy. You wouldn't want to stall this out. Now this is a proprietary number. It's a 13115. It's very likely an off-the-shelf component that they've rebranded so that it's labeled for uh, Milwaukee. You can't just go and buy it, even though it's just an off-the-shelf item. If you knew the crossover, you could. But check this out. So speed, it's probably not running at 10,000. Probably running a little slower. But the current, stall current, 54 amps. So you know if you if there's some schmoo in here, you get a, a nugget in, in here and it seizes up right solid. It would not be long for this life uh, drawing 50 amps. So that is why we have the current shunt over here monitoring how much current is actually getting drawn into this motor. And whilst I had the soldering iron out, I figured I might as well have a whiff of the carcinogens in there to see what they smelled like. And I can't quite place my finger on it. I think maybe APS or PP. This is, the guys are asking me how I identify plastics that aren't marked. This is how you buy a sample kit from uh, Crackmaster Car. And it will tell you what the stuff is by scent. Polystyrene. It's not polystyrene. You just gotta make sure you don't lose the bags. <laughs> or I guess you could mark them. Smart way. Ain't nobody got time for that. So let us try uh, low density polyethylene. And where is ABS? ABS. Okay, ABS kind of got a bit of a waxy candle smell to her and nice sheen. She's got a nice sheen to her too. There's some idea of plastics here. This guy, not ABS, my mistake. Uh, now I'm getting all my flavors muddled. We'll let that burn off. 
after the scratch and sniff test conclusively we can say that it is plastique <laughs> it, it, the closest I can come is ABS it's got a little different top note maybe some polyester in there it, maybe a little bit of a blend to get uh, the best properties of one and the other and sometimes the best properties is cost so a little bit of a different top note there but definitely not uh, not it's not nylon and it's not UHMW it's none of these yeah it's ABS and something else it doesn't smell like styrene I would say maybe polyester can't quite tell if it's a simple tinge of self-doubt or that vague throbbing in my forehead is indicative that maybe those Californians are onto something however with the state of homeopathic medicine being what it is, if a lot hurts you, then a tiny little bit is probably good for you. Right? <laughs> yeah, I got a splitting fucking headache now, partner. Whew. Now this is a nicely die-cast aluminium. Sure looks like aluminium. Doesn't look... Yeah, that's, that's aluminium for sure. Not Zamac. Aluminium. That's a nice little pump head there. Let's get into her. I bet you, you, you very likely, especially if you're in an abrasive slurry, you very likely would wear these lobes off. And there's an interesting bit of kit with this type of pump in that it itself, you'll never go over pressure. Even though it's a positive displacement pump, you can never go over pressure because if the pressure goes over the the force required to tilt that vein over even further, then it just short circuit. It's like a built-in relief valve. Okay, much better, much better. That's interesting to see. So I'm, I'm wrong. This viewing film is not what will break. This can crack and the thing will still work, no problem. That's just polyacrylate, so I was worried about it being uh, polycarbonate which is highly impact resistant but there is actually a proper nice thick quarter inch thick well that'd be metric so uh, what's that six millimeter five millimeter something like that um, thick piece of proper glass okay, I've got the impeller out I want to show you some construction details so this would be a vulcanized rubber it sure feels like vulcanized rubber onto a, a, a brass core, which is the D style of drive. And there's a little cutout here. What that allows us to do is take any kind of bypass fluid and relieve it back to the inlet side so that there's no pressure buildup on the back side of this single lip seal. The other thing about this is, if you look at the construction, now there's there's no mitigation for thrust other than the impeller itself so this is free to move up and down what's holding it in place is this face and the glass so we need some lubricating uh, fluid on there some lubricating schmoo and we see they've done quite a good job on the front face but on the back face there's essentially well dry as a popcorn fart all we have is the oil what's separated out from the top stuff and we can also see here where the impeller compresses we're already starting to pick up schmoo you see that it's starting to wear off so they have done not a terrible job at deburring that but it's been deburred by hand and there is there is still a sharp lip there we're gonna get right in there and show you and by we, I mean the royal we. Focus, you fuck. Now, this is a bit of a manufacturing conundrum. How do you break that edge expediently? And we have a look. There is a sharp... You could shave with that motherfucker there. Didn't quite get in there. So, you, yeah. Luck of the draw. These are all hand done. So, at least that burning process is hand done. And it looks like they come in from here to machine it with a ball end mill or something and that's just the raw casting and then this is end milled as witnessed by this uh, helical tool path here 
uh, what would they call that? Uh, there's a name for that. Uh, John at uh, NYCNC, he's got it on the tip of his tongue, but uh, I prefer not to. Without further ado, we got to we gotta break that edge. I mean, there ain't nothing for it. You shave with that motherfucker, as I said. You could maybe use a, a deburring tool for inside what would come in through here, pull it back, and then deburr it that way. But I don't have one of those, so I'm in there with the, with the X-Acto. You can see why this was quarter-assed in the first place, because it's a pain right in the cunning linguals. One thing I wanted to point out, have a look at that O-ring groove. See how big that O-ring groove is compared to the O-ring? That's okay. You actually want that because the O-ring has to crush. And if you crush it down this way, it needs room to expand in the other axis. So a rookie mistake when you're making, when you're half-assing O-ring, well, when you're changing O-rings and you get an O-ring to fit whatever groove perfectly you know you see this and you kind of think well that's kind of loose maybe i could get the next size up jammer in there jammer in and lo and behold it leaks extrudes after a little bit it's because you need room in the groove itself to allow for that crush so yeah uh, rookie mistake that might save you a bit of a headache sometime if in uh because we all we yeah that's the thing we've all done it and just trying to save you some headache in case you're in balls deep somewhere in some third world shithole and you got to replace an o-ring don't oversize it that there is a right royal pain in the arse but the catharsis well like any good wife will tell you occasionally even if you don't feel like it you got to put in a, a, a proper hand job at, at the very least yeah, I got some calcium sulfonate grease on there. I'm told it's the most expensive because it's the most bestest for water. Not wiping out. Now, before we get the shaft in there, we got to get the lobes all in the same direction. Which, if memory serves, was that away. So that one's fine. That one's no fucking good at all. Getting her back together and actually got to revisit this. There's actually a, actually, actually, actually a lever arm for Pezing Le Piton, which means that this is up and out of the way of any kind of dust ingress or shit falling in here. It's, it's over in the casement. So unless you fully submerge this, you're very likely not going to get anything in here. So that was a bit of a red herring. This is cute though. For the arrow, the direction arrow, they got a little chunk of lamacoid just in an oddball shape that they've turned to the white side. Of course, Lamacoid is what you see on doors, you know, Richard, head um, head of marketing type deal. You know, people, they come in here, it's a piece of plastic, two-tone plastic. They come in here and engrave it with a rotary tool and it shows red in the, in the bar relief. So that's just an oddball chunk of plastic they're using for that, but I guess whatever. If it, oh, qu'est-ce que tu veux, ma jolie? Yes? Come upstairs and you'll see. Okay, I'll be upstairs in a little bit. No, he, he's so cute. Okay, sweetie, I'll be right up. Okay, so can I keep your shit door open? Yes. Okay. We got her back together before we check to see if she lets the smoke out. You're going to make this an actual useful tool with a couple hundred bucks worth of fittings and valves and gauges. Jesus. From, uh... Well, from the getting spot, the usual scumbags, but that way what we can do is we'll be able to measure the input and output pressures as well as throttle the flow. Before we get too full of ourselves, let's just make sure that this is turning proper wise. And we take oil or water from here, bring it around there, pressurize that side. So that is the correct way. Yep. Here's the setup. We got uh, 200 bucks, give or take, of fittings and assorted accoutrement, some wall valves. Now, this is a vacuum and pressure gauge. This is strictly a pressure gauge. Fuck off, fly. Summertime. Man, oh man. So, the thing is, the, the gauges do not care where the resistance to flow is coming from. Now, resistance to flow is what creates pressure. Pumps create flow. They do not create pressure. Pumps create flow. 
the resistance to flow it what is what gives you the pressure. If you don't have any resistance to flow, this outlet is open. You're not going to get any pressure. It's just going to blast through there. You won't see any pressure, but you will get lots of flow. Okay, so took me a long time to fill this nut old bucket up. Son of a diddly, I don't know where they come up with the names of these. But <laughs> no, we actually got dihydrogen monoxide in there. The stuff ought to be outlawed. It comes from, they got it in rocket fuel even. So we got 20 liters of that, which coincides with 20 kilograms, roughly five gallons, which coincides to, let's see, 2.2, 40, 50 pounds, 45 pounds, something like that. Yeah, I know, I know. So what we're gonna do is we're going to see the self-priming feature of this. Now it's self-priming because this is a positive displacement pump but there is a mechanical fuse, an automatically resetting mechanical fuse in here. See these lobes? If the pressure gets too great on one side, the lobe unseats. A well, further word on self-priming. Well, it's rated for 18 foot of suction head. That means this can be 18 feet above the level of the water and it will still pump. It will not self-prime at that level. It's just not gonna do it. The other thing is, you have to have as little restriction on the outlet as possible. Okay, so if you've got a column of water 75 feet high, which is what this is rated for, the thing is not gonna self prime. It just ain't gonna happen. So, in order to get the most chooch for your chotch when you're trying to self prime something, like if we keep this closed, it ain't gonna self prime. If we put restriction on the inlet, it ain't gonna self prime. If we well, let's just mess around. That's one thing to tell me. Yeah, it's easier to see it than to explain it. Okay, we're gonna flash her up with nothing in there. Both ball valves closed. We're gonna check the gauges. Okay, we got about 10 inches of mercury in the vacuum. Fuck all on the pressure side. I'm glad I put lots of schmoo in there. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna run her. Now we got this ball valve open and we can see it's not priming. What the hell is going on? And now we open the outlet. There we go. Now. Now we got the juicy jizzer happening. Now we got our tuchin like she's coal fired. We're gonna fire it up here. And what we'll do is we'll slowly close the outlet. See what pressure this comes up to. That will give us our ultimate our ultimate pressure head that we can get. It's supposed to be 75 feet. We can do a calculation and see if they're lying to us, just to keep them honest. Speaking ahead, I'm gonna nutto on the workbench. Sick, oh my fucking shoulder. Oh fuck. Oh, that's not good. Uh, yeah, still fucked, fuck me. Okay, so we're all good and primed. And we'll get this back up here. Key, okay, you attack. We're getting a max pressure of 30 PSI. So 30 uh, times 0.43, I believe. It's, uh, yeah, 60. 60 some odd feet we're getting. So that's pretty close to what they're saying. I'm gonna see how long it takes to empty this bucket. As I said, 20 liters, five gallons. Uh, we'll start stopwatch, you start, and at say five seconds, we'll give her. Okay, we're at 149 minus the dicking around. We'll say 140, uh, we'll say 135. Okay, so we take 95 seconds, and I conveniently have my calculator here. <laughs> so we take 95 seconds divided by 60 seconds per minute divided by 60 minutes per hour. Gives us 0.23 something something. Now you take five gallons per hour, divide that by that 0.230023 something something. You get 
189 gallons per hour in this test. Not quite what they're telling us we can get, but may, they, they quite obviously designed a test to um, make the highest number they possibly could. And this is not that test, which is just a dude in his shop, but not even close to 480 uh, gallons per minute we're getting out of this. And that's not even with any restriction to flow on the outlet. We're not pumping up. We're gonna throw all of this down to say 10, give it a fighting chance. And we're gonna run it on the high demand nine, see how long she chooches for, or if it powers out, if it overheats, that'd be the worry. What the fuck? Already? You gotta be fucking shitting me. It's only been 16 minutes. What the fuck? Must have overheated. Son of a diddly. It's not that fucking hot in here either. 22 dungaree science, 70 some odd in uh, real units. Okay, well, we'll just keep going. Aha! 28 minutes on the clock. We're at one bar. She shut her down. Now, uh, here's the thing there's no air cooling on this thing. That means that all of the heat from the motor has to get sunk into the pump and out the fluid. So if we're overheating, well this was at 36 uh, centigrade, which is, I don't know, 90 Fahrenheit. Having a look at this now, something just does not compute. We're getting 240 uh, gallons on this XC5 charge. That amounts to, according to this, that's half of the, so that's half an hour. Well, we didn't hit half an hour on the 9.0 battery pack. That's a new battery. It's been discharged once or twice and charged right up, right to the gunnels. Now the max head height, we're pretty close to the results that we're finding here, according to the pressure gauge. The lift height, pretty close to what we're finding on this. Here's a, here's a staggering idea, okay? How do we get around all the, you know, somebody, not saying the marketing department went too crazy on this one, but you know, you believe that I got some beans to sell you. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? Now we got computers on the internet and we got YouTube on every computer. Why don't the guys from Milwaukee do us a behind the scenes test of how they actually test this fucking thing? Cause I ain't getting the same results. So clearly the fault lies with me. But imagine that, what a, what a novel concept. You get the Makitas of the world, you get the Milfuckies, you got the Hilties, you got, do the test and show how they do the test and how they get the results that they claim they're getting. I have a feeling if we as consumers demanded that to see what was going on, that the numbers would be completely different. That's slightly less, um, less latitude taken, I would venture to guess. However, you know, I'm just a bumblefuck in the shop here doing my best to keep these guys honest. Maybe I'm making a mistake. Maybe there's a completely different test they do, but for fuck's sakes, why don't they show us? Why don't they show us? Hmm? Thanks for watching. Oh, as far as this thing goes, yeah, um, it's convenient. You hit the button and it just pumps. It's you. It doesn't seem to me like you're ever gonna get the amount of uh, the amount of fluid pumped out for a charge, and the, it seems to last about um, 30 minutes on this big guy, minus whatever it shut down at. As far as overheating, it didn't seem to overheat. It was the battery uh, low voltage fault that shut her down. Okay, what else is there? What else do you want me to test? Down in the doobly doo if you would. Thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a vice. Shit, they're on to me.